Uh huh. And you, Joe? Yeah, same. Uh, I didn't finish 17.5, but I got up through it. Great, great. Yeah. I, of course, have read everything once again. Mm, I still haven't had enough time to go into exercises and to, for example, examine the three ways of uh, kind of inducing the inertial motion structure to the Galilean bundle. That's like really interesting thing to do, I, th I think, and probably we'll do that uh, a bit later, maybe on the next uh, um, call. Yeah, I've prepared kind of new <laughs> approach to the calls today a little bit. <laughs> And it's new because uh, I kind of tired of uh, uh, like going through the pages in both books, in the paper one and in the uh, in the electronic one. So you can see my hands now, probably. Nice. Yeah, I, I hope you can see the book and my fingers. <laughs> So today I will be controlling it from my phone directly and just reading the real book uh, in front of you. Okay, so I think we should start, right? I, I think it's a little hard to read the text though. Uh, Sorry. Is it possible to zoom in or maybe I will have to switch to computer and see? Yeah, I can. I That's can better. Try to zoom in. Much better. Yeah, one moment, one moment. I just need enough uh, space here. I have a tripod and it kind of li is limiting. So probably I should test it like, no, no, book will not go this way. Uh, so it's kind of hard uh, with this zoom, maybe a little bit out. Okay. Does it look good? Uh, maybe if you get um, slightly more, maybe. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's good. I will turn it back. So let's start. Uh, okay, so basically today we'll talk about the space time and like the history of it, of the notion. Um, so, kind of the first point here in this first paragraph is about the fact that uh, the notion of space-time actually was there before Einstein and uh, space-time space was not Einstein's original idea, nor it, it appears uh, was he particularly enthusiastic about it when he first heard of it. Uh, and Moreover, if you look back into the history, to the times of Galileo or Newton, we could find out that they too uh, could in principle have gained like great benefit from the notion of the space-time and space-time per perspective at all. Uh, one moment, need to oh, do something. Uh, yeah really big book to <laughs> put it uh, wholly into the frame. Uh, okay, so and in the next paragraph he talks about the notion of the Aristotle and Aristotle's, Aristotle's space um, and he talks uh, like that's a, um, not a, like a true information so basically Penrose says that uh, Aristotle uh, didn't think uh, about space or space time like that, but probably like the global phys theory of physics of those uh, time, it was kind of like this. Um, yeah, and basically uh, he says that um, physical space is represented by Euclidean three space, here and um, 
This state of rest is dynamically preferred in this Aristotelian scheme um, from all other states of motion. And uh, we take the attitude that a particular special, uh, special, uh, spatch, spatial, spatial, okay, special, spatial. special, yeah, special point at uh, spatial, yeah, spatial, yeah, spatial. Spatial point uh, at one moment of time is the same uh, spatial point at a later moment of time. Um, so basically, uh, he means what what he means here is uh, his screen metaphor uh, depicted on the. Someone is calling me. Sorry, guys. I'm on the call. <laughs> Cannot answer now. So basically, he's talking about this screen metaphor here, and he says that uh, space um, in this Aristotle uh, scheme is basically like a movie screen. So, um, like the whole world around us is kind of projected on the uh, Euclidean space, and uh, kind of the change of the states uh, is. Uh, like a mapping of a new frame uh, in a cinema. So basically this point, for example, with uh, this mark here is the same in this second or in the next second. So it, it kind of doesn't change. And even if I kind of put the, my finger here, uh, it's the same point, basically. Um, so uh, we can also say that uh, space is absolute here. Yeah, what, and what about the time? So time here is rep represented by this camera, actually. And uh, if we kind of visualize it as a film, uh, like the reality as, as a film, like a big 3D film, <laughs> then basically the time is just a one dimensional Euclidean space, like a line. So we have this timeline uh, and we like the same as with E3, we have no preferred origin here, so it's kind of a fine space. And um, the laws of physics must remain the same for all time uh, because there is no preferred time parameter which these laws can depend upon. Yeah, and the space, as I have said before, is uh, E3 space. Uh, so it's basically just three dim dimensional Euclidean uh, geometry. Uh, and uh, now uh, in this paragraph at the bottom he talks about uh, simultaneity uh, and the distances uh, between like the time uh, and the distance uh, in the space. Um, yeah, so for Aristotle um, there is kind of the absolute time because uh, is the moment for him is the same, uh, not depending on the space, if you're kind of sitting currently at home or um, something is happening in the Androm Andromeda galaxy. So it's kind of the, the time ev uh, everywhere is the same and we have kind of the, the absolute time. Um, and if we can, if, if you want to measure if some events uh, are, hap like are happening simultaneously currently, uh, that then it, then it means that those events are on the same projected frame. So on this frame with a frog, for example, I don't know this like the event of some kind leaves uh, and wind here. It kind of happens at the same time as the frog jumps. So basically, um, simultaneity in a time here is uh, for 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 the for two events is being on the same projected frame. Um, yeah, and to measure the time interval, uh, we kind of just need to measure the number of frames between two events. So if you have like camera with one frame per second, we can just count uh, frames and the number of frames will give us the seconds. Uh, yeah, and uh, to measure the like space simultaneity or space distance between events, uh, you can use the regular distance in E3, so just like measure it as the difference between two vectors in the E3 space. Um, 
Yeah, so basically Aristotle and space-time is the direct product of E1 and E3. It's just a regular product space uh, where every event, like every two diff uh, discrete, um, sorry, uh, every event is a point of, that, uh, of this space-time and for any two different points basically of this product, uh, like Tx and T apostrophe and X apostrophe. Uh, basically, those are just two different events. We have a well-defined notion of their spatial separation um, and time separation uh, just uh, by taking the difference uh, and measure like the absolute, the length, for example, for the second uh, argument and for the first one. So basically, that's the theory of the Aristotelian space-time um, and like really old view onto the uh, physics. Any questions, suggestions, maybe some thoughts about this? Okay, then I will continue. Um, yeah, the, the next subsection is about Galileo and space-time for Galilean relativity. Uh, yeah, and probably I will come back. Ah, oh, so yeah, we, we also has, uh, have this picture here, it's just Aristotelian uh, space-time, the product of E1, this line here, and E3 depicted as a Two play, like two-dimensional plane, but actually it should be a cube, right? But we need to suppress one uh, spatial uh, dimension here because uh, we cannot go uh, to 4D on a paper. Yeah, anyway, uh, anyway let's continue. So um, Galileo is famous uh, because of his like relativity theory and uh, rel relativity principle. And uh, it, it is demonstrated uh, usually in textbooks and here also uh, by using the quote from, uh, I don't know, some kind of the book written by Galileo probably. And um, this quote is about shutting uh, yourself up with uh, something like friends or I don't know, butterflies, uh, like some balls, I don't know, uh, on the ship uh, and like below the deck. On, uh, on some large ship and he kind of talking about his um, he, he talks about his experience and uh, his observation that uh, if you run a bunch of uh, experiments uh, below the deck on the un uh, on the ship which moves uniformly like without, with no acceleration then uh, everything, uh, you, you will kind of uh, won't be able to uh, make a distinction uh, like if ship m moves or if ships just stay on the place. So he kind of describes here uh, the like something like the droplets will fall into the vessel beneath without dropping towards the stern. Uh, also, the drops are in the air, the ship runs many spans so and the butterflies will, will fly as they fly um, uh, as they fly when the ship uh, is just standing so basically nothing will change uh, on uh, on the ship and on the events happening below the deck and basically that mm -hmm. happens because like the whole volume of the air and everything um, uh, ev everything below the deck moves with the ship together so it's kind of like a uh, one you prevent our air resistance what was that way you prevent any air resistance you would have outside you said they yeah. are moving with the ship yeah yeah i think it's also important to note that this looks like you're still only from a local perspective mm -hmm. relative to the surroundings you're moving, but, but locally, it seems. Yeah, um, yeah, of course, of course. If sure. so, you shouldn't uh, you shouldn't look out the window. 
because yeah, exactly. yeah you, you will see some kind of i don't know waves or islands uh, go, going uh, like mo moving outside yeah so basically galileo G galileo teaches us that the dynamical laws are precisely the same uh, when referred to any uniformly moving frame and as uh, team said locally uh, yeah, and this was an essential ingredient of the of his wholehearted acceptance of the Copernican scheme, whereby the Earth is allowed to be in motion without our directly noticing this motion, uh, as to as opposed to its necessary stationary st status according to the earlier Aristotelian framework. So it seems that Aristotle thought that Earth is like kind of stays in place. Uh, yeah. It sounds it sounds kind of weird from the <laughs> perspective of uh, nowadays. Yeah. So, anyways, there is nothing uh, to distinguish the physics of the state of rest from that of uh, the uniform motion, and uh, there is no dynamical meaning to saying that a particular point in space is or is not the same point as some chosen point in space. Uh, at a later time. So basically it means there is no absolute space and absolute space fails. So in other words, our metaphor of the cinema screen, it, it, it kind of breaks and uh, we cannot mean meaningfully identify like the same points in the space uh, because for example, if we consider the rotation of the earth, uh, like this point where my finger points currently, it will move in the next seconds, uh, second, like uh, with a re re really big distance relatively to this motion. And uh, you can kind of go further and include more uh, motions here. And Penrose describes it uh, here in an example, like we can also consider like the Earth's motion about the sun also and take that into consideration. And if you will do that, then you know that this point kind of is traveling through the space with a really big velocity and it kind of goes like, I don't know, 30 kilometers in seconds, something like that. But you can take uh, other motions into account. For example, the movement uh, about the center of our Milky Way galaxy of our solar system. Uh, or, for example, the proper motion of the galaxy itself around the center of the Virgo cluster. Uh, so, from this example, we kind of see that uh, that the problem is serious, <laughs> and points are kind of moving all the time, and it kind of there is no um, like uh, trivial way to um, make the identification between the two points in two different time uh, moments, like moments of time. Uh, yeah, what's next? Uh, what's next? Uh, yeah, so basically it says that we have a different E3 for each moment in time with no natural identification between these various E3s. Uh, and that breaks these, uh, like mathematically, our um, cinema screen was this direct product here. And now, after reading the chapter 15, we know that what we have here is actually a fiber bundle with a base space E1 uh, representing our time and a fiber E3. So in fiber bundle, we don't have this point-wise identification between fibers. So we, we kind of have this uh, more advanced structure um, applied to the notion of the space-time. And it's depicted here like this. So uh, basically now we don't have this kind of brick structure and we have more pr profound, maybe more complex, like m bundle manifold structure here where we only have the base space and the fiber hanging over the point in the base space and we kind of cannot identify those E3s, but we can kind of uh, draw the word lines into this uh, manifold, which will kind of uh, 
depict uh, the progress or uh, evolution of our system. Um, one moment, want to read a little bit here about the Kaleland space time. Maybe I, I should say more something about this. Or, or, or just let's read it together. So, Galilean sp space time is a fiber bundle with a base space E1 and fiber E3. So, there is no given pointwise identification between E3s. So, there is no absolute space. Uh, whereas, each space time event is uh, assigned a time via the canonical projection. So, we can, can map uh, from the fiber to this line and obtain the time. And we, we still have this uh, absolute time here. Mm -hmm. And particle histories, word lines, are cross sections of the bundle. So we have those word lines uh, as cross sections of the bundle. Uh, and the inertial particle motion are depicted uh, as um, what the structure of the bundle specifies at the stra straight word line. Yeah, and that's kind of the question for the next um, section. What does it mean to be like a straight word line? Any questions? Okay, then let's continue. Let's continue and we are going to the Newtonian dynamics in space-time terms uh, and basically uh, here we kind of uh, enrich the Galileo's picture. We, we will make it like more uh, meaningful or full probably. Uh, yeah. So anyway, the bundle picture of, of space-time is um, good, but uh, how to express the dynamics of Galileo and Newton in terms of it. And um, it's not surprising that Newton, when he came to formulate his laws of dynamics, found himself driven to a description in which he appeared to favor a notion of absolute time. And basically, uh, this need um, of the absolute time uh, by Newton, uh, like the reason for it uh, was lying uh, in, the, uh, of, in, in his inability to develop the theory of the vector bundles. At that uh, at, at those times, so basically he kind of could not explain uh, the scene without like the dynamics without using some kind of the um, like illusion of the absolute um, absolute space. Um, yep, and uh, in the next paragraph. Penrose, uh, talks about the history of the Newton laws um, and it was surprised for me that actually he proposed five or six laws uh, at the beginning. It was like interesting to know and uh, the first law was the Galilean principle but later he simplified those and published uh, only three Newton laws, uh, Newton's laws uh, that we are now familiar with. Uh, in order to make the framework for his laws precise, he needed to adapt an absolute space with respect to which his motions were to be described. Uh, and kind of here Penrose describes the problem uh, of the fiber, like with this notion of fiber bundles and non, I, I mean, this non-existence of that notion at the time, at the Newton's times, and that Newton kind of uh, could, can, cannot kind of grasp it at uh, those times. Yeah, so, and without such a notion, it's hard to see how Newton could have proceeded without introducing some concept of absolute time. And indeed, he did that. Yeah, afterwards, we go to the like first law here. Uh, and basically, the straightness of the word lines. So in the first law, the first Newton's law is just a, state, a statement that the motion of a particle upon which no forces act must be uniform and in a straight line. And this is called an inertial motion. In space-time terms, uh, the motion, uh, or like history of the particle, uh, yeah, is called like the world line 
of the particle and uh, in fact uh, like those world lines must be the cross sections of the Galilean bundle and uh, for the motion to be inertial those cross sections must be kind of straight uh, yeah so the Galilean bundle must have a structure that encodes the notion of straight straightness of world lines and afterwards Penrose describes like three ways to go uh, here I want to address one, one moment want to address those two exercises so we have two exercises here one and two and the first one is about Mm -hmm. he, he talks about like uh, why it is it's uh, like like a far too strong condition to endow the, a fiber bundle with a bundle connection and the answer here is I don't know <laughs> because uh, kind of that was my first thought I thought oh probably he'll introduce some kind of the bundle connection there but he said no it's too strong uh, and probably it will complicate uh, kind of the matters a lot and basically maybe that's the reason why uh, and the second ex exercise is about the cross sections kind of about the cross section like explain the reason for this and it seems kind of obvious to me so like the the point maybe we need to think more about this so what is a cross section is uh, it's it just uh, like a bunch of points going through the fibers and basically we kind of fix in some object uh, in the space um, like a particle yeah and th that particle will be described by some point in space and the cross section will describe this particle uh, in the dynamics in the time so basically it seems like obvious thing so it's just the dynamics of the particle okay so let's continue let's go back and ask the question about this structure so what uh, structure will encode the notion of straightness of the world li lines here um, oh yeah sorry it was on the previous page like the first way to go and the first way to go was uh, the um, affine structure so, so he kind of says that we need some kind of the affine structure there uh, when restricted to individual fiber agrees with Euclidean affine structure uh, and that affine structure is done on the like fiber um, manifold fiber bundle or bundle manifold something like that uh, um, I'm not sure that I understand what he means here so I think uh, maybe I will make it more clear the next time when I will do, do, do the next exercise or find some solutions to those uh, so basically the next exercise will be about kind of explaining every of those uh, structures like a fine structure and the two next structures I will talk uh, next so the second structure is about like specifying the infinity to power 6 family of straight lines that naturally resides in the product and take this over to provide the straight line structure of the uh, Galilean bundle while forgetting the actual product structure of the Aristotelian space-time uh, so the first question here is why uh, he has uh, like six dimensions here it's not clear to me also uh, need to give it some thought uh, later and it's kind of not, not, not really straightforward or uh, like trivial or clear to me like how can we um, use those uh, lines from the like direct product in our uh, Galilean bundle and so I kind of don't I don't understand the second approach at all uh, probably the first one is even more more accessible to me but I don't understand this second one and probably the most uh, clear here is the third one because we have read the chapter 14 about connections and uh, yeah the another way um, to give the Galilean spacetime uh, this straightness structure is to consider 
uh, it as a manifold, uh, which possesses a connection, which has both vanishing curvature and vanishing torsion. Uh, is a good question why those should vanish. Um, and we kind of need to think about this also. Maybe this information will be disclosed later uh, in the chapter or in the next chapter when we'll talk about uh, space-time and Minkowski geometry. Yeah, and this is, uh, the, here is a note that this is quite different from uh, possessing a bundle connection. Yeah, and that's true. Uh, because uh, it, it kind of it's the same in some sense uh, because we know from chapter 15 that we kind of can interpret the regular connection as a bundle connection but basically it's like a more grounded way to go um, where we use those uh, pretty standard notions of the parallel transport etc okay so uh, that was that, that was the first uh, Newton's law and basically the uh, Galilean principle here of relativity. And now we go to the second one. Um, and this uh, second law is um, connected with geodesics actually. And that's exactly what Penrose tells us about this uh, in the next paragraph actually. And uh, he says that by having a connection, we can introduce the notion of the geodesics and uh, define uh, Newton's inertial motions uh, by uh, like a simply straight lines or actually those geodesics. Uh, yeah, so it's still like first law. Okay, and we can also consider world lines that are not geode the geodesics uh, and these rep represent the particle motions that accelerate. And the actual magnitude of this acceleration is measured in space-time terms uh, as a curvature of the world line. And according to the Newton's second law, this acceleration is equal to the total force on the particle uh, divided by it, its mass. Um, so that's the reg regular form. We all n know uh, the second uh, law of, the, of, of Newton and it's like F equal to MA or A equal F divided by M. Um, and uh, here we have like this uh, more profound perspective on that law that uh, this uh, acceleration could be expressed uh, using the curvature of uh, our connection here and the curvature of a world line um, for a particle of given mass uh, provides a direct measure of the total force acting on the particle so probably I, I need still think more about this also like uh, to understand it better how curvature can express the like the measure for the total force. Uh, uh, I, ha I have a question here. Yeah. Uh, the, in the parenthesis, it says, apart from those which are simply straight lines in individual e -3s. So wh what does that represent? Is that like a, a, a photon uh, moving? Well, what time is not? Or wh what is that? Uh, he talks about geodesics in E3. Uh, so we have geodesics in our Galilean manifold, right? And he uh, kind of um, make a warning for us here that we should think about those apart from the regular geodesics of Euclidean space. So just uh, for uh, it, it, it tells us we this. We should just ignore them. Yeah, this, this phrase is just not to be confused with the geodesics in the regular 3D space, which are basically only the straight lines. So he yeah, can't... So, so geodesics always moves through time, then, I suppose. Uh, who, who moves? Or what? The, the geodesics that we should be paying attention to, they always move through time. 
Yeah, yeah. And actually, the, geo the geodesics we are paying our attention here is uh, actually the movement in, in time. So right. basically, geodesics or the lines on our Galilean manifold, uh, they are actually the dynamics. So they represent the movement in time. And uh, geodesics in E3, they just represent the, like, the optimum or optimal trajectory between two points. For example, uh, like between my fingers here is a straight line. But th th that's, that's not like, um, uh, that's not taken into account all the forces acting on the particle here and the nature of the particle. Because if you, if you will have some kind of the charge here and some kind of the uh, electric field, then this straight line will not be the geodesic for the particle, right? And basically we, we have uh, this 4D structure, the Galilean manifold, and all the known forces like electric force, strong force probably, and weak force, I think, and also gravity. So all of those forces they influence, they, they are influencing, influencing uh, like impacting, impacting all the uh, objects in the space, right? And uh, their space-time evolution will be described by those uh, word lines. And basically the curvature of those word lines will show us how much of the impact was done on the particle or an object. So, and curvature here is basically how our word line will we, kind of will roll through the space, something like that. So, uh, like torsion and curvature, they could be understood as uh, like roll and twist, something like that. So, um, um, I, 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 yeah, but it's still a constant motion. Yeah, so, 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 so basically what, what I mean here, and I, I mean that you can take some kind of a line and no, it, it could be like this, maybe not with this bump, maybe more continuous, but I, I'm kind of imagine, imagining it uh, on some kind of the warped space, you know, like the space time is kind of dynamic here probably. And uh, like the travel through the space time or the dynamic or evolution of our point or object uh, like those uh, curvatures of the trajectory they will show us uh, like the um, how to say that like the distance from the, the affecting. yeah yeah they, they kind of shows us the difference between the uh, straight geodesic line here and this, yeah, the deviation from the ideal path. Probably. Yeah, so ideal path is like that, and that path is taken by a point when no force acts on it. And uh, we have kind of those kind of deviations, and space-time warping is kind of the force impact on the particles. That, that, that's what, uh, what I mean here. Yeah, I, I think those parts are pretty clear. I just wonder about the parentheses. So, uh... If mm -hmm. no one else is wondering, I think we can move on. Yeah, and anyway, uh, have I answered your question? Yeah, I was just wondering about that parenthesis thing, and you answered that uh, pretty much from the start. So okay, it's, great, it's great. Uh, but anyway, I just wanted to make it clear about like this thing about curvature, and uh, I was interested to think about the, that myself, and that's actually what we, it, we, we it's have It's an important done. concept, so it, it, it bears repeating, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that uh, maybe in the future I should kind of uh, to, to make some attempt to explain torsion and curvature in the like more intuitive way. Uh, I have tried to do that for myself, but it kind of uh, takes too much time and uh, pr probably uh, only after I will finish that book, I will be able to do something like that or maybe by taking some kind of vacation. <laughs> anyway, let's continue and not go uh, into the like uh, nearby matters. Um, so the next law is the third law 
of Newton and the Newton's third law asserts that the force on one of um, on one of the particles uh, like, like on okay on the particle uh, as exerted by the other is always equal in magnitude and opposite uh, in direction to the force on the other as exerted by the one of oh, it's kind of complex formulation. So basically it says that like the total sum of the forces on the like physical system is kind of zero. Uh, and uh, like the forces between different particles, they kind of balance out uh, themselves. And so basically it's kind of kind of like this we have like two particles it's always an equal reaction yeah yes yeah. so so basically we have like this force f1 uh, 2 and this force uh, sorry i'm looking on the screen f21 and they are uh, opposite in the direction and equal in magnitude so total force or like sum of forces is equal to zero so it's basically the third law uh, yep, yeah. and uh, we also should provide here uh, something called uh, the force law, uh, informing us what function of the spe special uh, special. Oh, sorry, that word <laughs> makes me crazy. Spatial. Okay. Spatial. Spatial. Thank you. Spatial distance uh, between the particles. Um, yeah, like what the magnitude of that force should be and what parameters should be used for each type of particle uh, describing the overall scale for that force. Um, in the particular case of gravity, this function is taken to be the inverse square of the distance and the overall scale in a certain constant called Newton's gravitational constant or this G capital here multiplied by the product of the two masses uh, and here here we have this formula so like the masses of two particles uh, the distance between those squared and this uh, proportionality constant called the Newton's uh, gravitational constant uh, okay and what we have here Oh, we have a, a nice picture. Great. So that's exactly what I've been uh, drawing to you on the paper. So basically, basically we have this balancing out here, like two particles. But Penrose also uh, writes something here about word lines. Let's read it. So he talks that the force between those particles acting instantaneously in a line joining the two particles at any one moment within uh, the particular E3 um, that the moment defines. Okay, and Newton's third law asserts that uh, force on one as exerted by the other is equal in magnitude and opposite in direction to the force. Oh, yeah, that, that's true. Okay, and the first picture, this A, is about like that Newtonian force at any one time, the total force on a particle, double shafted arrow, is a vector sum of contributions attractive or repulsive from all other particles. Oh, okay, so the total, uh, yeah, the other way to state it is that the total force on the particle is the sum of the all forces uh, done on that particle by other particles or objects. Uh, okay, so let's go on and Basically, this subsection section ends with the um, paragraph about the power of Newton's law, uh, theory, and it's remarkable that from just these simple ingredients, the theory of extraordinary, extraordinary power arises, and it was used for like centuries, and it's really accurate. Uh, there is a magnitude like ten to power to power seven here. And it's really impressive achievement, especially for the like uh, 17th century, and particularly because Newton uh, had only uh, like uh, tools to measure the numbers to the 10 to power three. 
any questions, maybe more questions. Uh, meanwhile, I will address a few exercises here. So the third exercise is about three ways of inducing the straightness structure on the Galilean bundle and comparing those uh, and kind of explaining how those work. And I would be interested to see the solution also. It's to understand especially the second approach because it's not clear for me what what it means. Sorry, my screen my screen turned off. Mm -hmm. And the fourth the fourth uh, exercise is about like trying to write down an expression for the curvature in terms of the connection what uh, normalization condition on the tangent vectors is needed, if any. Uh, so, yeah, basically it's those exercises are kind of will help us uh, to understand better the matters of the, the of the curvature and connection on that Galen bundle. Anyway, I haven't done those and Probably I will read the uh, solutions, uh, the, the solutions uh, which are already on the internet because I need to kind of save uh, save my time. Don't don't have enough time for everything. Uh, okay, so um, the next uh, section is about the principle of equivalence and kind of approach into the Einstein theory. Yeah, so despite this extraordinary pre precision and despite the fact that Newton's great theory remained virtually uh, unchallenged for nearly two and one half centuries, we now know that this theory is not absolutely precise. Uh, moreover, in order to improve upon Newton's scheme, uh, Einstein's deeper and very rev revolutionary perspective uh, with regard to the nature of gravitation was required. and. Yeah, and basically this like new theory, it uh, does not in itself change Newton's theory at all. Uh, so basically it kind of preserves it, but kind of shifts uh, the view on the overall scheme. And it's uh, backwards compatible. Yeah, yeah, true. Because uh, you kind of, um, me personally, I have often heard from different people, oh, the, the science, you know, it's it's not so, uh, how to say it, like objective or uh, like re reliable. You know, the Newton's theory failed because of Einstein uh, and now we kind of can argue with, yeah, with but, those people. But, but it's refinement, not throwing everything out, mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah. and. Those people usually can say something like you should believe in God or something like that or believe in nature. Uh, I respect uh, like the believing in God and the faith, uh, um, but there are different reasons to believe in those things. Uh, and you shouldn't mess up with physics and science actually here. <laughs> That's what I, I'm thinking. Anyway, so basically the first uh, uh, change um, or, or probably I should name two of those. So basically two main changes introduced in the Einstein's theory is the finiteness of the speed of, of light and also the principle of equivalence. So we will talk today about the second one. And uh, it's interesting that both of those um, like principles or facts and also about the speed of light uh, can be traced back to the Galileo himself. So it's kind of uh, uh, really surprising for me that maybe if uh, those guys have had even my even better, uh, I don't know, uh, intuition or something, maybe they could uh, go further there. But probably the math mathematics uh, wasn't ready at, th at those times and uh, Therefore, we kind of should have waited for the 20th century for the theory to come. Um, okay, anyway, we all probably heard about this um, Galileo's ex experiment, 
this dropping the like two rocks from the Tower of Pisa and it's depicted here like this uh, and basically what Galileo observed is that if you um, don't take into the uh, if you kind of neglect the air um, resistance then if you drop two rocks of different masses from like a really big tower those rocks will uh, travel to the ground and land on the ground simultaneously so basically the effect of the um, gravitation is kind of compensated by the inertia of the objects so yeah interesting you know this has been done on the moon with the feathers as well feathers and a heavy object there's a video of this somewhere a hammer a hammer right feather and, and a hammer probably as far as i remember yeah and it's kind of uh, it, it was confirmed there <laughs> Uh, I saw on the Wikipedia page a, a big, there is a big table of different experiments confirming uh, this theme, and probably all, also the ah, and the principal equivalence also. So basically, uh, like how uh, that principle is connected. So first of all, we need to understand these uh, like the notions of the like gravitational mass and the inertial mass and um, basically uh, this uh, yeah first of all Penrose says that uh, this uh, principle is a particular property of the gravitational field uh, and he have uh, he has a picture here with uh, a big tower but with uh, charges and he demonstrates that with electric force this experiment will not work uh, as it should so it's like a feature of the gravitation and the property of gravity is Galileo's inside depends upon it the fact that the strength of the gravitational force in a body exerted by some given gravitational field is proportional to the mass of that body whereas the resistance to motion uh, is also the mass so basically uh, we can kind of treat the mass of, of the body um, in a different way and uh, I mean in respect to gravity we have the gravitational mass and that mass will kind of um, deter determine the uh, amount of the force um, on, the, on our object and the second one is the inertial mass and the inertial mass uh, is kind of the uh, resi mass of resistance some kind of the, of the resistance of the body to move so and the inertial mass uh, will act the same way with other forces uh, so like with uh, electromagnetic forces for example in the same way and basically in the case of Galileo's, uh, Ga Galileo's exper experiment uh, lies this equality that the gravitational mass equals to the inertial mass and that's why the different um, uh, rocks of different masses will fall to the ground at the same time if we neglect if we will neglect the air resistance. Whew. Yeah, uh, those Galileo's insight uh, that that I have said. Okay, okay, that that was here. Um, okay, the next paragraph talks about electric field example. Uh, Yes, yeah, so basically he says here that it it's like some kind of a fluke of nature that the inertial and gravitational masses are the same uh, and it's like once again the property only of the gravity so ah uh, yeah he also said that we can uh, distinguish between passive and active gravitational mass and basically uh, that's uh, about this equation here so we can kind of um, uh, have like two views on the two objects here if the object acts on some 
other object, then, then the mass which acts, acts here is the active one. For example, I will consider this big M here as active. And uh, the uh, object on which the gravitation is acting, this mass is passive uh, mass here. Yeah, so it's kind of just a matter of the like relation or the viewpoint on the masses. But the main uh, distinction here is the gravitational and inertial masses, probably. I, I, I don't think that this passive uh, active distinction currently is really uh, is important. It seems to me it's not so important for us uh, currently. Anyway, uh, yeah, he says that inertial mass here uh, will uh, kind of preserve uh, its meaning and will act precisely the same. Uh, but uh, in the for the electric charge, the gravitational mass and uh, like this passive gravitational mass here uh, will be replaced by the charge. And basically, we have the different force law for the electricity, and we have charges here and other proportionality constant here. And basically, that's why we don't have the notion of the gravitational mass. It's kind of inconsistent with the electric force. Okay, so Galileo's inside doesn't apply to electric forces uh, and other forces like weak or strong force. It's a particular feature of the gravity alone. Uh, yeah, and uh, in the next uh, paragraph, uh, Penrose uh, gives us a few examples. Actually these three next paragraphs will show us some examples. So in this example, he talks about plain example and he said that the effects of acceleration and of the Earth's gravitational field cannot be distinguished simply by how it feels inside the plane. And actually that's the principle of the equivalence we were talking about. So uh, basically, we cannot distinguish the acceleration from the gravitational fields. And we can experience it uh, while on a plane. And uh, he says that this, the effect is a very familiar one in air travel, where it's possible to get a comfortably wrong idea of where down is uh, from inside uh, of the air, uh, aeroplane that's performing an accelerated motion. And actually, you can kind of confuse where down and up is, uh, especially when the plane does some kind of the uh, like extreme maneuver. Yeah, and to see how the Galileo's inside uh, Galileo's exp exp experiment is connected with this principle, we can use the insect example, and uh, it's depicted here on the. Uh, on the picture below, on the figure below. Uh, I, I cannot manage to, <laughs> to put the astronaut here. Uh, anyway, uh, so you can imagine that wh when, when, you, when you will drop those two rocks, you will have an insect sitting on the top of one of those. And for the insect, the uh, other rock uh, flying down to the Earth will remain uh, uh, without motion at the state of the rest. And basically that what it says that uh, kind of these, like the action of the gravity will be compensated by the acceleration of the rock insect uh, is on. And the same way uh, an astronaut on the orbit free falling on the orbit uh, together with the uh, space station. He uh, will see space station uh, in a static uh, state. So the space station will not move because the acceleration they are experiencing is the same. And basically the action of the gravity will be uh, compensated here. So we have this free fall state and basically uh, the key to the Einstein uh, insight was to consider this Galileo's experiment 
and from, from the perspective of the uh, perspective of the free fall. Okay, and uh, yeah, we have talked about this cancellation, and this fact is it is a direct consequence of the fact that uh, passive gravitational mass is the same as the inertial mass. Ah, it's a direct consequence of that fact. Huh. Yeah, yeah, interesting. So basically, my, I, I think that could be derived from the uh, Newton's second law, like, you know, like G constant, uh, G small constant will be equal to the acceleration. So basically, acceleration will be equal uh, to the gravity we have on the Earth. Uh, yeah, so now when we have this when we have this pr new principle, we should kind of change somehow our laws uh, for the Galileo Galileo's manifold or Galilean bundle. And um, we need to change the notion of the in in inertial motion. And uh, basically uh, with, with gravity, like in the previous case, we uh, have ha ha we have had that notion uh, formulated in terms that a particle is subject to a zero total external forces, external force. So the total external force on the particle is zero. But with gravity, we have a difficulty because of the principle of equivalence. There is no local way of telling whether we experience gravity or do we experience some kind of the acceleration effect. And this was a new a novel view of Einstein to regard the inertial uh, motions as being those motions that particles take when the total uh, non-gravitational forces acting upon them is zero. So they must be falling freely with the gravitational field. Um, so basically the inertial motion for the for the Einstein uh, is when uh, the total of non-gravitational forces is equal to zero. So gravity could act on the body and we can compensate that by like falling freely. And we can, we, we can have like uh, a few examples here. If you open the free fall uh, page on the Wikipedia, for, ex Wikipedia, for example, you will see some examples here. And like really, really good examples, I think. Um, yeah. So basically, uh, the the insect we have seen already uh, on the picture, um, like here, and the astronaut they uh, experiencing uh, the inertial motion um, while falling freely um, in the Einstein scheme. But from the Newtonian point of view, uh, they experience the, gra gra the uh, gravity force, actually. And uh, from Einstein's perspective, standing on the ground, for example, is not uh, an inertial motion because uh, the gravitational force is counteracted by the normal force from the ground. And the, the, therefore, the non-gravitational forces acting on, on the object are not zero and it's not uh, an inertial um, motion. Also, flying in an aircraft uh, is not uh, an inertial motion because we have the force of the lift there. Uh, descending to the Earth using a parachute also uh, is not an inertial, an inertial motion because it balances the force uh, of the gravity with aerodynamic drag force. Yeah, so what we have also here, like, and, and examples of the, like, objects in free fall or Einsteinian uh, uh, inertial motions are like spacecraft with propulsion of going up for some minutes and then down. I, I'm not sure what, what, what that means actually here. I, I, I have thought about spacecraft uh, or space station going on the orbit and it seems to me like an inertial mo motion there. Uh, 
uh, yeah, and basically the moon, for example, is also experiencing the uh, inertial motion uh, in the Einstein view. Okay, so what we have here, maybe I forgot about something. One moment. I think this idea is like really mind blowing um, because in this picture, it's like when you drop something and you see it falling to the ground, it's actually in an inertial frame of reference, the object that we say is falling, it's in an inertial frame of reference and everything else is being accelerated upward toward that object that we say is falling. So like if you, if you drop your hammer or your feather or something, um, it's actually not the feather that's, that's falling. The feather remains stationary or in its inertial frame and everything else around it is accelerating up to the feather. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so, so you, you're talking about, uh, I, I, I just want to grasp the whole picture. You're talking about the third observer or are you talking about the observer on the feather, like this small insect here? Yeah, the one, the one on the feather. Um, uh -huh. So, uh, and, and please re repeat it. I just want to understand it. So I'm saying if I, if I drop a feather, um, then there are no non-gravitational forces acting on the feather. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so if that's the case, then the feather is in an inertial frame. Yeah, 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 true. However, on, on my feet or, you know, from my chair or something, I have a, I have a contact force. Right. There's something that's actually pushing upward on me. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, so, it was it was a big revelation for me to understand that this way. <laughs> yeah. So so it's actually like everything, you know, when I'm sitting still here and I'm in front of my desk, uh, it's it, like these contact forces that are pushing upward are actually accelerating everything upward. And then if I drop something that, that and, and allow it to go into free fall, that actually is an inertial frame of reference and everything else in the room accelerates up toward it. It's not that the thing that I dropped falls to the ground. It's that everything in my room is accelerating upward. Mm -hmm. It's a very counterintuitive picture. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of re 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 really counterintuitive to me. So like this normal force, acting from the floor I'm like sitting on, on me, it's kind of accelerating me somehow. Not just kind of, it, it certainly is. But, but why? <laughs> <laughs> but it's accelerating everything around you too. Mm -hmm. So you, you don't have any relative motion to everything in your room, but everything in your room is being accelerated except for when you drop an object and it's in free fall. So basically this acceleration going up uh, is balanced out with gravity, right? And we kind of stay on the same place this way. No, it's not balanced out. Gravity is not truly a force. We are actually all accelerating. And if you want to stop accelerating, go into free fall. So in a sense, without acceleration, uh, we should be in f falling to the core of the earth. And th it is the, the acceleration that keeps us uh, where we are. That's exactly right. That's mind blowing. <laughs> it's very mind blowing. It's that we're all actually accelerating upward right now. <laughs> and there's nothing to actually cancel it. Uh... <laughs> Yeah, nice point. Really nice point. I need to kind of meditate on it, <laughs> lay down on the bed and think more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nice catch. Re really nice. Um, yeah, so basically the paragraph ends uh, by comparing those examples I have shown you uh, in, in the browser. Um, and basically we have talked about everything here 
and we can go to the last section for today. Oh, it's it's pretty pretty big one. So, okay, guys, do you have enough uh, strength to go through the next one, or should we leave it to the next call? I would actually like to leave it uh, and be able to read it, but uh, I will accept whatever you decide. Yeah, but I agree. Yeah. Anyway, anyway, we can kind of we can repeat it if you want to. We can do it two times. Maybe let's just do a light overview rather than going through it thoroughly right okay. now. Okay, Let, let's yeah, do yeah. yeah. Let, let's do it this way and do just like a light overview. Okay. So basically, in the next section, uh, we will try to push uh, or like in, to improve our Galileo picture and Galileo bundle uh, and update it to the Newtonian space time. It's actually confusing to me, like. Why Newtonian? We have already kind of introduced the equivalence principle. It's Einsteinian uh, space-time or something like that. And basically, uh, the ideas uh, stated here is the ideas of the Ali Cartan. Cartan, probably it's, it sounds something like that. Uh, Ali Cartan, uh, and uh, like in his uh, Penrose makes uh, like another liberty with history here he kind of uh, jumping forwards and he says that we can use really nice picture developed by uh, Cartan and roughly speaking this Cartan scheme uh, 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 in Cartan scheme the inertial motions in this Einsteinian rather than the Newtonian sense provide the straight world lines of space-time so basically we kind of change the curvature there as far as i understand it uh, what i have here difference in uh, gravitational fields uh -huh. okay connection for n so as far as i understand it yes yeah, we kind of replace the connection there with uh, the new connection and the connection now will possess the curvature uh, yeah and it it will be torsion free here um, yeah and anyway later um, he describes uh, the like albert astronaut example and he describes uh, the two different effects which will be happening with that astronaut or like uh, a sphere actually around him. Uh, so we can kind of imagine uh, a sphere of points around an astronaut uh, falling freely uh, onto the Earth, for example. And because of a big distance here, we will see that uh, the points uh, like the gravity is acting um, in the direction of the core of the center of the earth and therefore it will make uh, like the action of gravity will make this beautiful sphere into some kind of the el ellipsoid here and we will have the tidal effect uh, on that sphere but if you make the sphere around some gravitational object for example the earth and you will cover it into like really big sphere you will observe the other effect uh, and this effect uh, it will, will um, act as a shrinking of the sphere. And basically those two uh, are called also curvatures and the first one, this tidal effect one, is called veil curvature and this one is called Ricci curvature and uh, that's exactly how they act in the space-time. And as far as I understand, this Newtonian space-time here is actually the uh, almost Einsteinian space-time, you know, uh, like uh, it's updated Galileo's picture with the principle of equivalence, but not yet having the principle or like the fact that the speed li of light is finite um, uh, introduced into it. So basically here we're just talking about uh, like uh, this Newtonian thing, but 
Anyway, I think that those uh, themes discussed in this section, they also apply to the Einsteinian uh, space-time. And uh, so it's kind of back backward compatible also. And anyway, they will be useful and will be used actively um, in the next chapters. So this uh, section is about like more uh, more about the ideas actually. And in the end of it, there is this paragraph, like a short note on the Cartan's ideas and their importance. So basically, Penrose says that in fact, Cartan showed that it is possible to reformulate Newton's gravitational theory completely in terms of mathematical conditions of the connection. And uh, these being basically equations of the, on the curvature, uh, which provide a precise mathematic, ma mathematical expression of the requirements outlined uh, above, uh, and which relate the matter density uh, to the volume reducing part of R. So, um, in, uh, he says that he will not give us the full description and probably we can like Google it and search on the internet and, and find some uh, descriptions uh, made by the Cartan scheme. And he says that because uh, this scheme is not necessary for our uh, later considerations uh, to kind of understand the full Einstein theory, uh, because the full Einstein theory in essence is simpler. And uh, however, the idea itself is an important one for us, and we will use it later in the like more deeper chapters, for example, chapter 30, concerning the profound puzzles lying deep down in the like quantum theory and uh, kind of trying to find the marriage between the quantum theory and gravitation. So probably uh, those Cartan's ideas will be useful there. Uh, yeah, so basically that's, that's all for today. Any questions, suggestions? Do you like the video and my fingers? <laughs> yeah, this is excellent. Great, great. Uh, I sent you on, uh, one uh, link uh, regarding the, the conversation about the gravitation. I, I just recall that Brian uh, Green had the video and demo subject. Oh, yeah. So uh, you uh -huh. might want to look at it and meditate on Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. We will take a look at that. Yeah, thanks. So I propose uh, for the next time to try to finish this chapter. We will repeat everything. I mean, uh, section uh, concerning the last section like 17.5 um, also I have some news for you guys uh, I, uh, I, I've i been contacted by some uh, how to say it a friend of Eric I, I don't know already Eric's consultant something like that I don't know I don't know how to formulate it correctly and he, he asked me to provide him some kind of the schedule for the next two chapters. Uh, he asked about chapters 18 and 19. Uh, and I, I'm assuming that we will have like one more call for the chapter 17. Two calls, next two next calls will be for the chapter 18 and three for the chapter 19. But it's kind of rough estimates actually. Um, yeah, and Eric will try to visit us and uh, to take, like, participate uh, in our calls and maybe also provide his thoughts and maybe to learn something from us also. So uh, probably um, we will not have uh, uh, those, the, like, like the flexibility of uh, shifting our time uh, span because uh, it, it's kind of will be more um, how to say it correctly respectful for Eric to uh, have the like uh, fixed time for our calls so we will have like a little bit stricter 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 right uh, more, more strict uh, uh, boundaries on the time of our calls probably 
but that's like not uh, of course it's not uh, how to how to say it it's it's not like a strict rule uh, i just wanted to mention this uh, just out of the uh, like res respectfulness something like that so you're talking about uh, eric weinstein yeah i'm talking about eric okay. weinstein yeah yeah usually he is uh, online at the morning uh oh. I don't know how about the. Sorry, one moment. I, I I need to increase your volume because I'm not hearing you well. Uh, can you repeat, please? Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I was just thinking that usually when he is online, he is uh, at the morning time. Uh, so so uh, and we we have been here at the evening. So. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Eric has joined us for one call before. Yeah, like probably for a brief. I don't know how much uh, of a time he was here because I was involved too much into uh call. <laughs> yeah, he was only at the beginning of the call for like 20 30 minutes tops. Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm yeah, anyway, th they they kind of uh like sent me their their thank yous <laughs> and they appreciate the work we are doing here and they kind of proud of our group and uh, really glad that we have done such a big progress here and still going that's great to hear cool. yeah 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 that's awesome I uh, I sent a message to Eric on Twitter asking him uh, about experimental searches for GU, and uh, he said he said he might get back to me uh, after Yom Kippur. So that was like a week ago or something. Uh, after what? Yom Kippur. Is it some kind of Jewish holiday? I, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, it's like the big holy day of the year. Oh, oh, okay, okay. I just never heard about that. Huh? Well, yeah, so hopefully, hopefully uh, I can talk to him about that further in the future. He just said he might get back to me on it, so I, I'm not, I'm not exactly hopeful for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, better be <laughs> yeah. surprised. Yeah. So but, but he might need some reminding. He probably has a lot on his mind. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So I'm just expecting not to uh, shift our calls um, like uh, when we have not enough time before the call, for example, like in two or three days. Right. But uh, for example, uh, and I will uh, kind of <laughs> now I will ask you, uh, I kind of need to shift the next call because I won't be able to ma make it uh, on the Saturday next time. So um, I, I'm asking you to shift it to the Sunday next time. Works for me. Okay, okay, great, great. Um, yeah, I, I try. What, what? Yeah, I, I try to be here. I'm not sure. Okay, uh, okay. Eight. Yeah, so, sorry about that, but uh, I just cannot move uh, the next Saturday out of yeah. my schedule, yeah. Okay, so anyway, uh, thank you guys for the call. Uh, I was glad to meet you today. Um, see you next time then. Have a nice week. See you. See you. Yeah, see, see you. you. Bye. 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 See you. Bye. -bye.